place. You cannot worship the Lord the way we have tonight and God not respond. You know, the glory could be in a place and some people don't know it because they did not give God a worship. And they can miss out on an on a opportunity and a timing of the Lord to do something in their lives. He created us to worship Him. And this is what it means to worship the Father in spirit and in truth and in the very beauty of holiness. The beauty of holiness means our motive is just to love him, even though we may have needs, but just to love him and show him how, how grateful we are, just extending our gratitude to his goodness, even though we don't deserve anything. But it's something about God. God has a weakness, you know. And his weakness is when we worship him. He has to respond. He can't help himself. Come on, let's give the Lord another hand of praise. Oh, Lord, we love you tonight. We praise you. We honor you. You may be seated in his presence. I, I, I sense that the spirit of revival has come. And I believe that most countries need a revival. Not just a few nights of evangelistic services, but the spirit of revival, I believe, has rest in this place tonight. And, and there's a spirit of expectation. Faith is high and that's it. All of us, as we unite together in the spirit of love and unity, we will see the hand of God moving among us. Hallelujah. The focus is him. We're here to, for no other reason but to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And I want to thank God for the angels of this house, Apostle Stephen and Pastor Sandra Hallford. Uh, we thank God for their dynamic leadership and... Um, you, you can see the leadership that God has given to them as a reflection even in the praise and worship. It, it, it is just dynamic. I haven't seen it better to tell you the truth. And I have been a lot of places. This is just awesome. You all are anointed of God, my Lord. Hallelujah. I can just stay there and just worship the Lord and just let him do what he needs to do. Hallelujah. But however, I believe the Lord has placed a word in my heart. And this afternoon, I was before the Lord, and he put this word in my heart. And, and I'm going to share it with you just for a few moments. And then we're just going to let God do what he wants to do. I believe freedom has already come. Deliverance has already come. We have been making our declarations over the last couple of days that all will be healed. All will be delivered. All who are unsaved will be saved. Hallelujah. And even in our songs, we, in our worship, we have been making declarations unto the Lord. And we know that death and life is in the power of the tongue. The tongue is our speech. The tongue is used as an organ to speak. And so we have declared what should happen in here tonight. And I know that God will honor our declarations and decrees. Hallelujah. I want you to bow your heads with me just for a moment. And those who are joining us by live streaming, this is a good place that you have tuned in tonight. And the Spirit of God is here in a special way. And we believe that God will do unusual things among us. So stay tuned and just be edified, be blessed. And if you need of a healing, the healing power of God will come out to you tonight. There is no distance in prayer. Father, we are so thankful to be in this environment, in this atmosphere, where it's evident that you're present. And Lord, even in the midst of all of this, we do not take for granted you gracing us in a special way. Lord, I submit myself to you that every word I speak will be the oracles of God.
Grant me clarity of thoughts. And God, that your name will be glorified and your people edified. To you alone, God, we give the glory, the honor, and praise. In Jesus' mighty and holy name, and all of God's people in agreement said, Amen. Amen. That's blessed. I'm going to speak to you for a few moments tonight on a topic that I believe is familiar to many of you. But I believe that there are some things God would say that may be a fresh perspective to some of you. And that something God has given to us, and we call it the kingdom of God. And I want to talk about the nature of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, or one of the gospels used God and the other one used um, heaven, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And they are one and the same. It simply means God that the kingdom belongs to him and heaven is where it's located. So the life of heaven has come to earth. Earth has a lot of problems. And so God brought that life that is in heaven to earth to take rule, to take control, to bring freedom to his people. If you hear, say amen. So the kingdom of God carries the understanding of God coming into the world to assert or invade or enforce his power, his authority, and his glory. And to exercise his rights against Satan's dominion. Because we must understand when we talk about Satan's dominion, the Bible says that he is the God of this world. Which means that it is a world system that he is over with different values, different standards, different philosophies. And, and so the word of God is written to say, what is God's standards? So Satan, you've got to understand, he perpetuates everything that is unholy and unrighteous. But the kingdom of God has come so we can rise up to the standard of God. And when we say the kingdom of darkness or the Satan's dominion, we are talking about sin, sickness, disease, demonic oppression, poverty, death. All of these things Satan has uttered to bring misery to mankind. So you've got to understand everything that holds us hostage is the works of the devil. But the Bible says, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested or revealed that he may destroy the works of the devil. And then it tells us in Acts chapter 10 verse 38 how God had anointed Jesus of Nazareth who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. And to be oppressed of the devil, it means that people are in bondage to sin, whether they're bound to drugs, alcohol, sexual immorality, you name it, people are bound. We come to understand that the enemy has afflicted so many of people, even including God's people. Many people are diseased. Many people are under a satanic oppression. And then, of course, there's the spirit of poverty, where there's lack, where basic needs are not met. And when that is the case, you find out that there is fear and anxiety and, 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 and doubt and unbelief will begin to develop. And that's not the will of God. So Satan comes and he oppresses the people of God. But I decree and declare tonight that freedom has come. So when you hear about the kingdom of God, it is more than salvation or the church. The church is the body that God has entrusted to reveal his kingdom. We have been given a sacred trust to reveal the goodness of God. The kingdom is God expressing himself powerfully in all of his works. Turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 9.
The book of Isaiah, chapter 9. And I want to read to you a passage that is familiar to many of us, verses 6 and 7. And it reads, For unto us a child is born. That's Jesus the human, representing God in the earth. In other words, Jesus the man had a beginning. Because he is man just like you and I. And then it says, unto us a son is given. A son wasn't born. A son of God is eternal. But the son of God took on human flesh. Are you still here? So the Bible makes it very clear that this person, Jesus, is the son of God. Jesus is the humanity and Christ is the anointed one. As the anointed one, he has an eternal spirit. But they are united as one to represent the Son of God. And it says, and the government should be upon his shoulders. In other words, what the government is given for, a government governs and rules. And so he brought his government that the rule of God now has come into the earth. Wherever there's God's rule, there is going to be freedom. Sickness and disease cannot dwell where the rule of God is. If I can, I have a witness. And it says, it should be upon his shoulder, and his name should be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So that tells us that even though he is the Son of God, he is God. So he has all these different titles. And then it goes on to verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace should be no end. This government that has come to the earth will continue to increase. Because more and more people will make entrance into the kingdom of God. The population is getting bigger and bigger as the time goes along. And then it tells us too. And, there should, and peace, and there should be no end. This is a supernatural peace that God endows in those who accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. And it says, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it in judgment and justice from henceforth even forevermore. We know that David's throne was in Jerusalem. And so Jesus came and he was in Jerusalem and of course he went into many different cities. But he came not to have a physical kingdom but a spiritual reign. A place where he will dominate in the realm of the spirit. Our problems as human is not natural, they are spiritual. Spiritual are uh, uh, all the miseries that we can have in this life is spiritual. And that's why the solution to mankind is not more training. It's not psychology. But people need Jesus. If you got Jesus in your heart, you're not going to rob a bank. If you know Jesus, you're not going to break into somebody's home and steal their good. Are you still here? So we realize that we have a heart problem. And God sent Jesus to reveal his kingdom. The life of heaven has now come to earth. So even though we have the presence of sin, the power of sin, and the penalty of sin, but with the kingdom of God inside of us, we can still walk in freedom even with the enemy around. Are you still here? That's why God has called a people to himself to walk by faith. He says the just shall live by faith. God always responds to the faith in the hearts of his people. And it says that this kingdom will be established with judgment and justice from henceforth forevermore. That's what we are doing in these three nights of services. The judgment of God is coming against the works of Satan. It's time that he receive a sentence. It's time that the justice of God reign in this place. So where there's sickness, it has to go. 
Where there is oppression, it has to go. Where there is cancer, it has to go. Where there is AIDS, it has to go. It doesn't matter what it is, but wherever the kingdom of God has come and the reign and the rule of God is present, we are a free people. That's the good news tonight. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. Isn't that good news? So when we say judgment, judgment means that you, myself, and all of us in this great body of believers have judicial power given by Christ. So it's time we make a decision and then we place judgment on the enemy. He has also given us justice. Justice means to administering of deserved punishment or reward of what the enemy has done against the people of God. That's good news to me. Turn with me, if you will, to John's Gospel, chapter 9. St. John's Gospel, chapter 9. Beginning at verse 31. Now this is when Jesus came and he healed uh, the blind man. He was blind from birth. And after he was healed, he had a dialogue with the religious folks, Pharisees and scribes. They didn't want to let God get the glory because they were enemies of Christ. But listen what it says. And this is the blind man speaking. Now his eyes is open. Verse 31. St. John's Gospel, chapter 9. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. The guy got healed and became an instant preacher. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him God heareth. Verse 32. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? Man, he got a revelation instantly. Even if he didn't read the Torah that much. But God allowed him to have a revelation. That in, from the time of creation, not one person who was ever born blind had their sight restored. Oh, this is powerful. And then listen what it says in verse 33. If this man was not of God, he could not do these things. He can do nothing. Verse 34. And they answered and said unto him, Thou was, listen what it says, thou was altogether born in sins and does teach us and they cast him out of the temple. See, that's a religious demon. A hardcore sinner is not that dangerous. But the people of religion, that's what we are fighting. But we cast out every religious demon in this place tonight. And I want to leave you with three principles or points tonight. As we talk about the nature of the kingdom of God. Number one. The reality of the kingdom will not be experienced unless you make entrance into that kingdom. Except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, unless there is regeneration or spiritual birth or being born from above, when we repent of our sins and ask Jesus to come into our lives, then we are born again. And when it says you can't see, it means you don't have the ability to perceive when the kingdom of God is at work. It'll be there and you wouldn't know. So he says, the only way you can access when heaven's life is on earth, you got to enter into the kingdom of God and have a new birth. So in other words, we're born into this world in a physical birth, but we need a second birth, and that's the spiritual birth. And that spiritual birth means that God's rule, God's spirit, makes entrance into our lives. So we become sensitive to the rule and the desires and the will and the intent of God. And then it says, unless you be born of the water and of the spirit, you cannot even enter 
into the kingdom of God. In other words, you can't enter into his reign. You can't enter into his rule. You can't enter into his dominion. That's the beauty. We don't have to be ordinary people. When the kingdom of God comes in us, Jesus says, don't look over here and over there. The kingdom of God is in you. And if the kingdom is in us, that makes us supernatural people. That makes us a people who can tap in to the rule and reign of God. That's why everybody in this place tonight is going to be healed. That's why everybody who is under a spirit of oppression is going to be set free. Because God's kingdom, we already made the declarance that we want the fullness of your spirit, Lord. We want more of you, God. And God heard us tonight. The nature of the kingdom of God. So, number one, entrance into the kingdom of God. Turn with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. And verse 14. Listen what it says. Now after that John was put in prison, that's John the Baptist, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Why did he preach the gospel of the kingdom of God? And saying, these are the words of Jesus, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. See, the kingdom is the good news. That's the gospel. Now we understand after Christ went to the cross and he died, we realize you can't enter the kingdom unless you accept what he done on the cross. Are you still here? He shed his blood. He died a cruel, humiliating, sadistic death on Calvary's cross so we can be saved. The Bible says that Jesus knew no sin, but he became sin for us so we would be made the righteousness of God. When we have union with Christ, he declares us righteous. He declares us holy. He declares us sanctified. That means we are a special, chosen, set-aside people, have a right to have his rule and reign in our lives because of what Jesus had done on the cross. So the cross is, 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 is what is needed in order for us to make entrance, recognizing that it was his blood that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. But then it tells us that first of all, to enter into the kingdom, we must repent. If we were going in an eastly direction, we make a complete turn, recognizing the fact that we are sinners and in need of a savior. And then when we repent, the Bible says, godly sorrow worketh unto repentance and to salvation. And so it means that God's rule and reign come into our lives. That makes us special. It means that God gives us a higher quality of life. But if you want to just be half stepping with God, then you will experience the full rule and reign of God. Because you're given too much opening to the enemy. He is already the defeated foe. But if you come in, a, in agreement with him, it gives enemy legal right to do. God is the lawmaker. Man is the lawbreaker, and Satan has a right that he can execute based on the fact that we violate God's law. And I believe that's the number one reason why the devil is able to afflict so many of God's people, because we are constantly violating the laws of God with sin, but also with health violation of the laws of God. You could be anointed and still die before your time. Because you see, we have a will. We have to determine that we're not going to violate the law of God. If you have a disease in your body tonight, and you know that you have a very unhealthy eating habit, you're overworking your body, sometimes seven days a week, and it breaks down, the first thing before God restore your health, you need to repent. You can't drink four Coke sodas a day and expect to be walking in divine health. Even if you pray six hours a day. You're violating a law. You will have the presence on you, but you will not be well. 
I want to educate somebody tonight. So if you know some dreadful disease that you're carrying and, and you're just taking a lot of pills and, 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 and the doctors are prescribing this because the quickest way to get poor is to have a serious illness. And chances are your health will still not be restored. You might be aid, aided by the doctors. They might give you what they call managing your disease. And when Jesus can step in tonight in one touch and instantly you heal. But we need to repent of those things that we have done wrong in violating the laws of God. And as it was spoken by Apostle Rick last night, it is important to understand you can't have no bitterness and unforgiveness and resentment in your heart. Begin the rule of God, the kingdom of God, would not be able to conquer that area in your life. In other words, it becomes a barrier. So it's important that we understand the nature of the kingdom of God because the nature of the kingdom of God is the life of God. Somebody say the life of God. So we understand entrance into the kingdom of God. Number two, it, the kingdom of God provides a higher quality of life. That's why it's called eternal life. Not only that it's a life that is perpetual throughout eternity, but it's a quality of life that we enjoy. Are you still here? In John 10 and 10, it says that the thief came what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. But when we want to move down into the lower life, like hating people, having unforgiveness, rebelling against authority, withholding the tithe, not speaking to certain people, doing all kind of stuff, we want to reduce what God has given to us. Given the enemy access. So a higher quality of life is why God brought his kingdom to this earth. Let's go to Romans chapter 14. Verse 17. The book of Romans. Chapter 14, verse 17. And it reads, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the what? The Holy Ghost. In other words, when we say meat and drink, we are not subject to the royal rule by what we eat or drink. It is not ceremonial in nature. That is not going to allow you to move in the kingdom of God, in the life of God. But then it says, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So we understand that God has given us a higher quality of life, righteousness. God wants us to manifest his righteousness. That is an act of the human will to do what is right. As God teaches us his word, we have to become one with that word. Righteousness means that we are in right standing with God. We in right relations with God. It means we are doing what is right in the eyes of God. And he says when you do that, it keeps the life of God's kingdom in us alive. And then through righteousness, then it says, and peace. Now, you got to understand that most Christians don't even have peace because they're not manifesting the righteousness of God the way God calls them to. Based on all that revelation that we have received, we can't just be hearers of the word. We don't want to be a people only of knowledge, but we want to be people who are doers of the word. Jesus says, my peace I leave with you. Not as the world give it, but I give it unto you. It's a supernatural peace. When you think about peace in the natural sense of it, we think it is just the absence of conflict. That is what we call peace naturally. But spiritual peace will abide even when external circumstances aren't right. Because it is supernatural. Even when all your bills are not paid, you still have the peace of God that passes all understanding. And then it says joy in the Holy Ghost. We're talking about a greater quality of life. He came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. He came that you may have life or have it to the fullest. 
And this is what the joy is all about. The joy is not when you, uh, uh, you get a boyfriend. That's happiness. And if that relationship falls apart, then there's sadness. But I'm talking about something that the Holy Ghost himself produces in us. The joy of the Lord is our strength. When somebody is filled with the joy of the Lord, they are strong in his might. In the power of his might. So it says, the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink, but in righteousness, in peace, in joy, in the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. That is good news. A higher quality of life is why Jesus brought the kingdom. And the government should be upon his shoulders. His supreme rule will be in the earth. Every satanic force will be defeated. That's what is he saying. That's why sickness had to disappear when Jesus came on the scene. Demons flee. It didn't matter what was people's misery or area of captivity. When they came in the presence of Jesus, they were free. Now that kingdom, Jesus has ascended back to heaven and now the kingdom is with the church. The church has been entrusted with the life of heaven. It has been entrusted with the God life, the Zoe life, and manifested to our lost and dying world that, hey, the good news is that God's kingdom has arrived. And then the third and final point. We're talking about the kingdom of God. is rulership, power, and authority. It's all about rule. Satan is the god of this world, the world system. He is not the god of the universe, he is not the god of the earth, but he is the god of the system. The system that people who reject Christ, then he rules over them. Are you still here? And that's why, because we were called out of darkness into his marvelous light. The fact that we were translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, don't allow Satan to use you as a tool or an enemy to tear down the work of God. And let me say this, human weaknesses, when people exhibit the wrong attitude, when somebody slander your name, when things happen that it, it hurts you, you got to remember the right perspective is simply this. God is seeing what in you has not been developed as a fruit. Whether your, your, your patience is there. Not saying that if you have authority, you have the right to correct. God has given us that authority. But you cannot be out of control too. Every time I say to my church, let's go right, and some decide to go left, it's a test of my own patience. Do I get up on the pulpit and blast them out, or I tell them in a nice way in love? But even though I have a right to rebuke. Couldn't even get an amen there. This is important. Rulership. Power and authority and dominion. Power means explosive, might, strength, dudamus. That's what it is. Authority, exousia. You have the right. You've been given the right to execute judgment and justice. And then dominion. It means that you have full rulership. Everybody you pray for will be healed. Every word you speak, God will honor it. And then you move into the... When, you, when there is dominion, it means that now... Things, the elements in the atmosphere are subject to you. You can speak to the storm and it will shift and go another place. Then you have the power now to turn water into wine. You have power to speak the word and teeth will grow as it will tonight in the mouths of many people. Unusual things God wants to do among us. We have made the declaration and if we believe it, God will manifest his glory. Let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20. And 
I want to say those who are watching by live, by streaming, tonight is your night for a miracle. God's power will touch you. It doesn't matter what island or what country that you are in, God wants to touch you. It is not by accident that you tune in because God has a miracle for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20. If you dare say amen. And we're talking now about rulership. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. That's why the kingdom is more than just having a philosophy or a belief or we have concepts. But you've got to understand it's about power. It's about changing life circumstances. Are you still here? That word, when it is activated by the spirit, it brings life. That's important. So we see here that Paul says that the kingdom of God is not in word. It's not just in talking. Paul says to the Corinthians saying, I didn't come to you with the wisdom of men, but in power and demonstration in the spirit that your faith may not be established in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let's go to Matthew chapter 4. I'm almost done. Matthew chapter 4. Verses 23 and 24. Listen G to Jesus' ministry. It cannot be more clearer than it is in these two verses of Scripture. Matthew 4, verses 23 and 24. It says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. What gospel he preached? The gospel of the kingdom. And healing all manner of sickness, not some, all. And all manner of disease among the people. Now we have been given that commission. He says, go. He didn't say pray for the sick. He says, go and heal the sick. He says, go, cleanse the leper. Go, go and give sight to the blind. Go and raise the dead. Freely you receive, freely you give. And then listen to what it says in verse 24. And Jesus' fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments. Even saints are tormented. That's not the will of God. That's what you call demonic oppression. God wants his people free. And those that were possessed with devils, and those that were lunatic, crazy folk, he healed. Their, their mental capacity was restored. They were whole. They were normal. And those that had palsy, and he healed them. See, that's what the kingdom of God is about. It's about God's rule, God taking control, removing human misery, removing the oppression, removing every form of affliction, removing every form of torment. That's what he's done. And then in verse 25, and there followed him a great multitude of people from Galilee. So we see here that there are three things distinctly as we talk about the nature of the kingdom of God, that, that it is the government that governs and rules. God wants to have dominion in the earth, and he brought his kingdom through Christ. Now that Christ has died, he has a body. He is the head. But we are in Christ. So being in Christ, we are in the anointed and the anointed one. And we have his anointing. So it means that we destroy yokes and we remove burdens. Are you still here? And so it is a spiritual birth to enter into his kingdom. Secondly, as we live according to the word of God, we experience a higher quality of life that we didn't have before we came into the kingdom of God. And thirdly, we understand the rulership, the power dimension and the authority and the dominion of God is in the kingdom of God that is in us. 
And then we must understand that the final direct judgment comes at the end of this age. Because there will be no more presence of sin. And if there is no presence of sin, there is no temptation. There is no seduction. So we don't have to worry about the power and the penalty of sin. We will be able to experience the full ecstasy of what the kingdom of God is all about. But for now, we are the church militant. We are engaged in a war. And the war is already won by Christ. He just said, I want you to just walk it out. He says, even regarding our salvation, he wants us to live it out with fear and trembling. Have a deep reverential fear and respect for the things of God. Remember that they are sacred. And he says, if you maintain this kind of, of, of attitude, then you would be able to experience the higher life on a perpetual basis. That's what God desires from all of us. You, you can uh, have some challenges in your finances, but you can still have his quality of life. All may not be as well as you would like it to be, but you can still live in that quality of life which Jesus came to bring here. That you may have life and have it life to the fullest. That's God's will. So we understand how important the kingdom of God is. God wants full rulership. Now the kingdom, many of us are Christians here tonight, but God doesn't have full rulership. There are some areas we don't want him to make entrance into our lives. Maybe it may be sexual sin, and you say, I'm not stopping that. But you can still speak in tongues because you receive it when you are hungry, and it's a gift. And the gifts and calling of God is without repentance. With God dispense, he never takes it back. I can live an unholy life and still heal sick folk if I keep cultivating the gift and still burn in hell and tell him, you Lord, you remember that the eyes of the blind open when I pray. Lord, I cast out devils. They have a cancer cured and diabetes when I pray for the sick. I have a responsibility to continue in his word. Then he says, you would be my disciple. He says, he that is born of God does not commit sin. You cannot perpetually live a life of sin and say you are truly born again. God is looking for holy people. And when God finds a holy people, there will be no measure. We will have the full measure and the full rule of God in our lives and also in our churches. And that's what the early church had. And that's why when the apostles came together, even the shadow of Peter healed the sick. And the Bible says, and everyone was healed. In other words, there was the full reign of God's glory in his kingdom. It was not just an anointing. An anointing is given for a function. But when you have the glory, the glory contains all the gifts and all the anointing. So there is no lack or shortage. It is the fullness of the Spirit of God at work. And I believe as we reach out in the worship earlier, that's what God is looking for. If you're not a Christian, you better still reach out. Get your soul saved, enter into the kingdom of God, and you have a right to healing. You have a right to deliverance. You have a right to the blessings of God. Because now you come into covenant with God, and now you have a new nature. Therefore, if any man or any person be in Christ, his spirit it means, he is a new creation. You're different. You will see with different eyes. You will understand. You will live differently. Your desires will change. That's how you know when you're born again. No, you're not perfect overnight. You are like a kid. You learn. That's why you are under pastor to be taught the word of God. So you can grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you will know how to be an equipped uh, soldier for the cross. That you can fight the good fight of faith, that you become skilled in righteousness. Are you still here? And then the enemy will have no entrance into your life. And when you speak the word of the Lord, God will honor his word. And others around you, you will be their witness. Because we will be standard bearers by living holy and inconsistent life that glorifies our King. I want everybody to stand to your feet.
Stand to your feet, everybody. This is important. It doesn't matter how many miracles God performs and healings. There is one miracle that, ex that exceeds any physical internal manifestation. And that is the miracle of salvation. And I sense in my heart that there are some here tonight, by human standards, you are a good person. But you have never been born again. You don't remember the moment that you repented of your sins and turned away and said, Jesus, come into my life and change me. And upon that experience, there should have been a traumatic change that you begin to walk the ways of righteousness. Not that you take communion or you're being baptized as a baby. Or maybe you sing the hymns of Zion. Maybe you in the church choir somewhere. But you don't really remember being born again. And if Christ were to come tonight, you wouldn't be ready to meet him. The greatest tragedy is to be alive and don't know Christ. That is sad. If he should call right now, you wouldn't be ready to go. Because we're not saved by our works. But it's by the grace of God, our faith in what he has done is what saves us. And then there are several of you here tonight you have made a commitment, but you're not walking on that straight and narrow path. Other things has entered into your life. You don't have a prayer life now. You're not in the Word daily. You don't have a spiritual appetite for the things of God. You're just casual. You know you're not in right standing. You need to make it right tonight. It is a serious thing not to be in the place where God wants us to be. Sometimes we can get destroyed and not have time to make it right again. And I want to ask those, we're not here to embarrass anybody, but I believe this is important. That those who don't know Christ as their personal savior, just slip up your hand just before I pray. Wherever you are in this audience. And the Bible says that many would be in hell because of fear and shame. If you're ashamed before a generation of people who constantly fail God, then you'll never stand in the real world and tell somebody I am a Christian if you can't raise your hands in a church full of believers. I want you to raise your hands. If you want to know, you say, I want to know Christ tonight. I want you to include me in this prayer. I want you to raise your hands. If you're in the sanctuary tonight, just wave your hands to me. Just wave your hands. I see that. I see that. I see that hand. Anybody else? You want to be included in this prayer? You know, I thank you. I see that hand. You can put all the hands down. You know, just imagine if you were to die tonight. Just in a split second, your spirit and soul begin to travel into a place of eternal separation from God called hell. And there's no way you can come back. There's no way. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. And nothing more tragic than you hear the gospel over and over and over and still wouldn't respond to God. What is so good in serving the devil who afflict people with sickness and diseases and, and how people in, in, a, in, in bondage to alcohol and drugs and, and cause people to go out of their minds and why we want him to be our master. The devil wants slaves. Jesus died because he wants us to be free. He wants you to have a higher quality of life. And there's several of you who didn't raise your hands, but you feel a strong conviction you need to be a part of this prayer. Tomorrow is in promise to no man. No man. And you need not to take another chance. And I believe that all those who raised their hands, and even several who didn't, if you really mean business with Jesus, Jesus said, if you are ashamed of him, he will be ashamed of you before his father. And I believe that when you say, hey, I'm making a change. I'm turning away from darkness into the marvelous light of Jesus. I'm ready to, to take a stand. I'm going to ask those of you who raise your hand to come and just stand right here at the altar. This is important. Don't hesitate. If you really meant business, when you raise your hands, I want you to walk quickly. Maybe you didn't even raise your hands. 
but you need to come. Come quickly. You don't have to be ashamed of nothing. You do not have to be ashamed. I want you to come. I want you to come. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. You are special to him. That's why he died. If, if he didn't die and I did not accept him, instead of here preaching the gospel and, and seeing God heal the sick and bring in deliverance, I don't know what I'd be doing. I could have been strung out on coke. I don't know. I could have been involved in some of the most disgusting things that I even can't even imagine. Because if Christ is not in your life, none of us can tell what we'll be doing. And all of heaven is rejoicing, the angels, because you responded to the cry of Jesus. And I want to commend all of you who are taking that bold step. I'm going to lead you in a sinner's prayer. And the Bible says, any person that comes to Jesus, he will in no wise cast out. In other words, he wouldn't turn you away because he came to seek and to save that which is lost. It doesn't matter what you have done. The blood of Jesus will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And you're not just repeating after me only, but you mean it from your heart. And a transformation will take place within. We are not saved by what we feel, but we are saved by what we believe. What we feel is the spirit of conviction that God is tugging at your heart and say, move. You need to make that commitment tonight. You need to make that commitment tonight because the opportunity may not present itself. You may not have conviction again. So you have to move now while the Spirit of God is moving on you. And I want you to repeat these words after me. And the congregation as a great source of strength to these precious men and women of God who are bold to walk up here and to surrender their life to Jesus. And those who are standing on this line, I want you to say it loud and mean it. Close your eyes right now. And I want you to say this after me. Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus I, acknowledge I acknowledge that I am a sinner, I am a sinner. and in need of a savior lord forgive me for my sins i know i have sinned against you in spoken words in thoughts and in deeds come into my life lord and change me you said in your word if i confess with my mouth and believe in my heart not my head but in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. I am saved. And I accept your word as truth. Thank you for saving me and writing my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Not with pen and ink, but signed with the blood of Jesus. I pledge tonight to live for you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a loud clap offering for these wonderful souls that have come into the kingdom of God.